Things are heating up as USC football is back in the hunt for the Pac-12 South. And women's and men's basketball are off to a perfect start. So many sports, but we've got you covered. Sports Scene starts now. Welcome to Annenberg Media Center. I'm Jody Storm Sullivan. And I'm Kristen Lago. The USC football team will be on the road again this weekend as they head up north to face the University of Oregon, with both the Trojans and the Ducks coming off of big wins over Colorado and Stanford. This weekend also marked an eventful few days for the Pac-12 Conference, with three upset wins. USC now controls its own destiny for the division title should they win their last two games. So, Jody, it was clearly a chaotic week in college football in general, but especially here in the Pac-12 Conference. Can you break down what exactly happened this weekend in the South? Of course. It was a crazy game in those late Pac-12 South games. You had uh, Arizona beating Utah in double overtime. That was very clutch, and that uh, gives USC the opportunity to really, like you said, control their own destiny in the Pac-12 South. And um, you had Washington State beating UCLA. They had that late comeback battle in the fourth quarter, and it really – that also kind of secured, not necessarily affecting USC's chances in the South, but it, it's always helps to give uh, UCLA a loss in the season in the South. Yeah. So with all the shakeups that happened this past weekend, what does that mean for the standings in the South? What is and what does that mean for the race to the top? You know, with that race to the top in the South, there's 16 different ways that the South can be won. USC holds advantage with eight of them. The best case scenario for the Trojans is for them to win their final two games. But even if they do lose to Oregon, they'll still have a chance if Utah drops one of their last two games. UC and Utah split the rest of the split the rest at four apiece. Uh, the only way that the Bruins can win the South is if they win their final two games since they're playing Utah and USC. For Utah, they're, they're a little bit better off. Their best case scenario is for them to win out, but then USC does have to lose one of their last games for Utah to claim that South title. And like you mentioned, before USC can concentrate on the Pac-12 South, they'll first need to focus on beating Oregon this weekend. So the Trojans lost two key defensive players in Cameron Smith and Lamar Dawson last week. So what impact is that going to have on the team as a whole? You know, well, obviously losing Smith is going to disrupt that linebacker core because Smith led in tackles, interceptions, and batted passes. With Lamar Dawson, the Trojans will lose that senior leadership that he really provides with the linebackers and through the rest of the defense. With these injuries, players like sophomore Uchenna Nuosu are ready to step up and fill these holes. Both he and Coach Helton talked after practice today about the next man up philosophy on the team. I don't have no problem with it. Uh, just more opportunity for me to play, so you know, I'm pretty happy with it. Got a couple of kids in a couple new positions uh, that I thought they did a, a very nice job with. Chenna being one, you know, having to move inside a little bit and uh, did a nice job there. But, you know, have a couple down, next man up mentality. With the next man up mentality for the team, what exactly is the defense going to have to do, Kristen? Well, fortunately for this Trojan team, linebacker is one of the positions with the most depth on the team. Though missing these two leaders on defense will disrupt the four-man core as you were talking about, it will also force players like Nuosu and Michael Hutchings to step up and really be ready to take some more reps. You know, obviously, Kristen, like you said, that depth in the linebacker position will really come in handy. It's just going to be a question of how fully that they can contribute and match up to uh, the losses by Smith and Dawson. We can expect the Ducks to attack the linebacker positions heavily in Saturday's game. The Trojans will have to step it up on defense if they want to control Oregon's explosive run game and will need to capitalize on offense as well to come out with a win. Stepping it up on defense and continuing the focus on the run will be necessary for USC against Oregon this weekend. I'm joined today by Paolo Ugetti. Thanks, Jody. Hey, Paolo. So how would you compare Ronald Jones and Royce Freeman as the two running backs for the teams? Well, I think uh, with Ronald Jones and Royce Freeman, they have, from a semantics point of view, there are very different types of running backs. Obviously, Royce Freeman came, in, came into the season as Oregon's lead running back. Ronald Jones is a freshman, so we didn't really expect him to become what he's become so fast. But with Royce Freeman, it's really all about quantity for him. He was a big part of the Oregon's offense when a quarterback, Vernon Adams, went out with an injury, and he's averaging over, almost 140 yards per game and 6.63 yards per carry. So he's a huge part of why they're the number one offense in the Pac-12. Ronald Jones, on the other hand, he hasn't gotten as many carries. He gets 10 fewer carries per game than Freeman, but he's been able to be explosive. He's like a cannonball when, he, when he's out there. Every time he gets a carry, he runs for seven yards a carry. That's his average. And he's been able to give the Trojans a good, off, a good run game despite the injury to Trey Madden. 
So you've broken down the strengths with Jones, the strengths with Freeman. How are the two teams' defenses going to be able to stop these two? The defenses will be a big factor in this game because they're both not that great. Uh, we saw we, they, the two teams have very high-scoring offenses, so it's going to be a high-scoring game. But Oregon's uh, defense has really been struggling against the pass game. They've allowed over 300 yards a game in the pass game and 37 points a game, which is worse than the Pac-12. So USC can definitely be able to combat them. Maybe Cody Kessler has a bounce back game. He's been struggling lately, so maybe he'll have a big game against Oregon. Uh, USC, they, their big improvement has been in the run game, defending the run game. They started at one point in the season, they were ninth in the Pac-12 at defending the run, and now they're, they went all the way up to third in, rush, in stopping the run. So if they can limit Royce Freeman to that, I think they'll be in very good shape. But as, we, as I said before, it's going to be a very high scoring affair. Yeah, so high scoring, we've highlighted the defenses, highlighted the offenses. Paolo, what's your prediction for this weekend? Uh, well, this week, I think I'm feeling a little optimistic. I think USC, even though they're going on the road to a tough environment up in Eugene, I think USC will edge out Oregon in a tough but a very high scoring game. I'll say 42-35 USC. So you heard it here, 42-35 USC. And I'm joined now by senior guard Brianna Barrett. Thanks for being here today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So before we get started talking about basketball, I want to take you back a little bit. So you're a local girl. You're from California. Yeah. Went to high school at Oaks Christian. Yeah. So was USC always on the radar for you? Was it always kind of a school you saw yourself at? Um, well, to be honest, I didn't really want to stay in California. I was like, I've been here my whole entire life. Yeah. Let me explore the world a little bit more. But I think, I think as like years went on, I was like, you know what, I, my family's here, what's, why not, why not stay in California? So, um, honestly, I don't really like Adidas, so I was like, no to UCLA, <laughs> yes. but, uh, and USC is like a great school, I came here for one of my visits, and uh, Michael Cooper, who was my coach at the time, who was the coach recruiting me at the time, um, he went to a bunch of my games, and he was in contact with me, um, and so when I came here, uh, I just kind of fell in love. I was like, you know what, this is a great school. Um, the program I wanted to do, I wanted to originally be um, something like a broadcaster or something like that. So I was you know what, the, com, uh, the communication school is great here. Yeah. So um, I was like, you know what, why not? Like, I love the school. California is my home. I, I would want my family to come to the game. So. So, yeah. I feel that. I'm from yeah. Long Beach, so I have okay, that. Should I go to. away or should I stay yeah. close to home yeah. struggle? Yeah. yeah. And then, so you're currently pursuing your master's. We were talking about the co communication management program earlier. I'm interested, how do you find time to balance, you know, your life as an athlete, but also with your life as a student, and then just kind of being in L.A., trying to do some fun stuff, you know, being a normal person as well. How do you find time to balance all three of those? Um, like you said, uh, being a student athlete is tough, so you have to know how to organize your time well. So, basically, any time I have off away from basketball and stuff, I kind of utilize that time to do homework and work and um, school work. And then after I'm done with that, I just kind of explore L.A. a little more. Um, and I guess just giving myself time to just relax and breathe because it is a lot of work. Um, but school first and basketball and then being a normal person <laughs> is really it. So being able to balance that is really key. So... And then, so, I'm going to ask you a little fun question here. I was reading your bio, and there was one line that really, like, I had to stick on, and I was telling everyone okay. about it. So it says, has always wanted to be on a dance crew. Is that true? It's in your bio online. That I did say that, <laughs> didn't I? You know what? <laughs> That's really funny. Um, I... I, I dance a lot, like joking, jokingly, yeah. I'm not a good dancer at all, but I feel like I could be a background dancer because like, I don't want to show any moves right now. I might oh, you know, I was gonna ask embarrass all of you guys here. Move. I might embarrass you, so. <laughs> no, um, that's really funny. I just loved watching ABDC, mm -hmm. America's Best Dance Crew um, on MTV. And like, I thought it was really awesome. And I watch a bunch of videos on YouTube and stuff and I always pretend like I could do it. But I think that's why I wrote that. I'm not like a great dancer or anything. Yeah, I was gonna say if you weren't playing basketball, maybe a little Trojan dance force action. <laughs> I mean, maybe you got. If there's a spot, yeah, call me. You know to call. And then so back to the court. We'll focus on basketball now. I'll stay away from dancing a little bit. So your season kicked off last week. How has it been being back in the swing of things? Um, it's actually been really great. Uh, the freshmen are doing really well right now. Um, we do have a, basically a brand new team. So being able to get that. Um, the chemistry on the court has been really important and off the court too. So uh, being able to kind of teach the new kids um, how it is being an athlete here um, in a great college and like Pac-12 is a great, um, great conference. So playing and like we haven't been playing any Pac-12 games obviously right now, but being able to give them experience 
um, just playing at a new level, a different level, has been awesome for them, and they've taken it really well. So uh, it's been great playing again. I missed it. Um, season, I love season. This time is the best time of the year, I think, um, being able to play again, and I think it's just been awesome. So you're one of the seniors coming back on the team. You've kind of talked about how you've had to step into a leadership role. Are you looking to improve upon anything um, individually yourself this season as we look forward? Uh, personally, I think I've just been focusing more on my defensive aspect on the court. I think with my defense, um, it really helps my team with energy-wise. And um, me personally being a little more vocal, I think I, I don't really talk as much. I usually just like show my game. And so being able to talk is going to help a lot for my team since I'm the point guard. So I have to know. Um, just how to communicate with my teammates and making sure everyone's in the right spot on the court and um, everyone knows what they're doing. So I think I'm going to focus on like my leadership aspect, um, communicating better and um, just playing with more energy and more pride and purpose. Yeah, well, that's all for it. Thank you so much for being here. That was course, great. Love the little me. dance steps from there. <laughs> <laughs> and you can catch Brianna along with the rest of the women of Troy now 2-0 as they head up to Spokane, Washington to take on Grand Canyon, West Virginia and Gonzaga as part of the Nysmith Memorial Hall of Fame Challenge beginning on Sunday. USC Volleyball has a new record holder and senior outside hitter Samantha Bricio. In the Women of Choice sweep of Oregon State, Bricio collected 13 kills to put her at 1,919 career kills. It was this pipe shot that Bricio recorded her 13th kill and broke the all-time record previously held by Alex Jupiter. Bricio's success this season has been really inspiring for her teammates. It inspires me that she was able to do that tonight. All of us on the sideline were getting the chills. Sarah, I think, started crying. So, I mean, it's a really big deal for us, especially getting to play with her. It's, it's quite the honor. Bricio leads her team in more than just kills. At USC, she's also the career holder in aces, attacks, and points. She's also been named the Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Week six times this season, which is a new Pac-12 record. She's tied with the all-time conference record of nine career honors. She's also been named the ESPNW National Player of the Week and ABCA National Player of the Week twice in her career. Bricio is going to look to continue her historic run as the women of Troy head out to Arizona this weekend, featuring a matchup against Arizona State on her birthday on Sunday. After a heart-stopping victory over Cal State Fullerton last weekend, the USC women's soccer team is gearing up to face Princeton in the second round of the NCAA tournament. I'm joined by Josh Cohen to discuss the women of Troy. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah, so let's get started. In last Friday's matchup, USC mounted two comebacks, faced a double overtime situation, then one on penalty kicks. Looking back to that game, what were your top takeaways? Well, you just said it two comebacks and that was huge. We knew that this was a resilient team with that bounce back ability, but I think we really saw it in one of the toughest tests that they faced all season long against Cal State Fullerton, a very talented side. So the bounce back ability was huge. Secondly, we saw that USC has the genuine pace to compete with the best of the best. Fullerton had speedsters on the wing, in the middle of the park, and USC was able to outrun them and outwork them. And that's huge moving forward as they progress through the tournament. And they're going to be on the road this weekend, so what exactly can we expect from the team as they go to take on Princeton? Yeah, very tough. They're going to be in Charlottesville to take on Princeton. Princeton, a very good team, just scored four against Boston College. The biggest thing is going to be continuing to play out of the back, continuing to play the possession-based style. That's really huge for head coach Kadani McAlpine. It's huge for the team. When you have the midfield triangle in there with Nicole Mole and Mandy Freeman and Morgan Andrews, the ability to outpossess teams is why they create so many chances and why they have those sustained spells of pressure put so much pressure on the opposition, as we saw against Fullerton. 30-some-odd shots, which is remarkable. And I know it's going to be hard, but if we had to choose just one player to watch, who's your player to watch in this next game? Yeah, such a talented team, but I've got to go with number three in the middle, Morgan Andrews. Outstanding since transferring here. She's really taken on a leadership role, which has been huge. So it's more than just five goals in the last two games and all of the gaudy statistics she's put up. She's really emerged as a leader. The thing about Morgan Andrews is that she controls the flow of the game. She dictates the pace and everyone else follows her lead. And that's absolutely huge. She's organized defensively. She's so good in possession. And that's, again, that's a huge thing moving forward. And ultimately, the team follows her lead in so many different ways out there. That midfield triangle, Freeman plays off of her in that holding center defensive mid role. And then Nicole Mullen, who works tirelessly, they all play off of each other so, so well. So Morgan Andrews, again, five goals in the last two games. Can she keep the streak alive? She's been awesome this season. Will be a huge part of you know, USC if they make a deep run. 
number three is going to be a big reason why. Yeah, and I think it'll be really interesting to see if she can keep that momentum up going on the road. No question. Yeah. Well, the women of Troy will take the field in Charlottesville, Virginia this Friday. And now to give us an update on the other sports on campus, let's toss it to Alexa Palermo as we light the torch. From the court to the pool, the Trojans have been dominating these past few days. Let's check out all the success the weekend had to offer. It's time to light the torch. Let's start off with men's basketball, who dominated in their game against Monmouth last night. They scored 100 points for the first time since 2002, while three different starters scored 20 points to bring the Trojans to victory. The team spent the night constantly rotating through positions. Yeah, whoever goes in the game has to play and play hard, and, and we've had a terrific preseason. Our players are playing extremely hard in practice, uh, and, and, and they played hard tonight. Up next for the boys is a battle against New Mexico on Saturday night at the Galen Center. The women's basketball team was also victorious over Santa Clara yesterday. Four different women of Troy racked up double-digit scores to get an 81-46 victory. USC is now off to Spokane, Washington to play three games as part of the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame Challenge. Now let's dive right into the pool where Dion Reed placed first on the men's platform at the Diving Invitational on Saturday. Alongside Reed was Samantha Adams, who took third on the women's one meter. Senior Colin Pollard won three meters on Sunday, while freshman Madison Witt won on the women's platform. Both men and women's diving will attend the Arena Invitational this weekend at LA College. The torch has been lit, so get excited for another week of amazing plays and stunning saves. Now we're going to take it over to Ben, who has the latest on social media. Thanks, Alexa. With wins across the board for USC Sports over the weekend, you can likely imagine the flurry of activity that transpired on social media as a result. If you can't, however, fear not. I'm here to get you up to speed on some of the week's top posts. First up is USC kicker Alex Wood, who along with some of his fellow special teams boys, tooled around the Flatiron Mall in Colorado this weekend, accompanied by some gargantuan stuffed animals. Wood posted to Instagram about the trip with a remixed reference to rapper Easy es Boys in the Hood, captioning the photo, cruising through the mall on my K9, jocking the kiosks, skipping the lines. That is an NWA plus caption, Mr. Wood, and although I'm going to ask that you take this as you see fit, it does seem that you and the five boys in the mall know a little something something about being legit. Moving on to some of their fellow boys on the gridiron, USC football's come from behind victory over Colorado on Saturday resulted in many players endorsing interim head coach Clay Helton as their pick for being the permanent head coach heading into next season. Following the game, multiple players tweeted hashtag Helton2016 to show their support. Among these included offensive lineman Zach Banner, cornerback Kevon Seymour, tight end Connor Spears, receiver and quarterback Jalen Green, and linebackers Cam Smith and Sua Cravens. It is great to see the team united behind Coach Helton in such a pronounced fashion as they prepare for a critical game this weekend at Oregon. Although there were a lot of updates on what was happening on the field this week, there was also quite a bit of chatter from SC football players on topics unrelated to their sport. Most notably, linebacker Sua Cravens found himself in complete disbelief over the weekend after women's UFC fighter Ronda Rousey was knocked out by underdog Holly Holm, marking Rousey's first career loss as a professional. Sua tweeted, I'm so shocked Rhonda lost, I can't even spell her name or words correctly. What is life? What is English? What is this device I'm typing on? Although it is a bit alarming that Sua lost control of some relatively basic cerebral functioning as a result of this fight, I must say, he does raise some deep and provocative questions about what we perceive to be our reality on this earth. For what really is life? What is English? And most importantly, what device did he actually tweet this from? I wish I could say that I have all the answers, but unfortunately I just don't. However, I think I may know a couple people who might. That'd be our hosts, Kristen and Jody. Back to you, ladies. The USC football team wasn't the only one who enjoyed their trip up to Colorado this weekend. President C.L. Max Nikias also took us on a tour of Boulder through a series of Instagram posts. Nikias began his tour to Colorado like many of the Trojans enduring the cold and braving the 30 degree temperatures. And as the players made their way onto the field, the USC president was right alongside them cheering them on to victory. Finally, he gave us a glimpse at the post-game scene where he was caught fighting on with his favorite football team. Well, that's all we've got for you today. Make sure you tune in next week as it's Rivalry Week. Both football and volleyball will be gearing up to face the Bruins. Have a great week.